So have you ever wondered what common house plants will truly make the cut, especially in large collections? These are the plants that survive plant culls and they're still there days, weeks, or even months and years later, even when people's obsession collection gets a bit huge. Stick with me and let's have a look at some of mine. Hi, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical house plants. So today's video is going to be a bit of a two-part mini-series. This will be the first one, and the second one will come at the end of the week. So today I thought I'd start with the 10 plants, 10 common plants, that have survived in my care, and by that, I mean, with collections as large as mine, a lot of the times what people might tend to do is they get a slightly more rare or difficult to find plant into their collection. And at some point, as you might be able to see, you run out of space, <laughs> which ultimately what that means is things need to go. And unfortunately, a lot of the times it tends to be these common house plants purely because the thinking without them, I think, for most people is it's a common house plant. I can find it any time that I want and I can just replace it, basically. So it's something to be said, and I'll be showing you my top 10, when certain common house plants survive cull after cull after cull when new plants are coming in. To me, that means that these plants have got staying power, they're not particularly difficult, they bring joy many weeks, months, or even years later. So I thought it'd be quite interesting to share with you some of mine. Now, I do know that a lot of my followers have also got large collections. Some people are just starting off with their collections. But if you want to share your kind of top five or top 10 common house plants that have survived for years, months, whatever, in your care, even when other ones have left the collection, so to speak, please do so down below. I think this will be quite interesting for all of us to have a look and see and see if there's any overlap in kind of what we're experiencing. But without further ado, let's dive into the first plant. Just to clarify as well, these plants are in no particular order. It's just the way that I've written things down. First plant, I don't have in front of me because it's way too large for me to move and it's downstairs in my guest bathroom, although there are versions of it scattered around this space as well. But I will hopefully be adding in a video to show you my big mama jama of a plant, basically. And if this might come as no shock to anybody, it's a golden pothos. There is something to be said about the ease of care, the fact that it can take an awful lot of abuse, the fact that it doesn't need an awful lot of light, to the fact that the golden pothos still remains in a lot of people's collections for many, many years potentially to come. And to be fair, I've had my family who have had some version of the same golden pothos through cuttings, through propagations, for probably almost as long as I've been alive. So that should tell you something. Now I will say, as I said, there's other versions of it around the space, and I am saying golden pothos, but I am kind of really encompassing a lot of the epipremnans into this collection, because realistically, at least in my experience, most epipremnans, even the variegated ones, even the slightly different colored ones, I'm thinking of the Cebu blue, they are all kind of very similar in their care needs and their demands, all of these things. So just rattling off the top of my head, and hopefully if I've got some videos, I will add them to the side. I've got the Cebu Blue now. I've got the Marble Queen, the Pothos Enjoy, the Mandula. I'm trying to think what else. I've got a variegated Epipremnum Pinatum. I've got an Epipremnum Pinatum, uh, Epipremnum Amplicium. So... There are quite a few of them, and they are still all here. In one way or another, they are all still here. <laughs> and I say one way or another because the people that have been here for a while and the people that 
know from when I kind of redid the conservatory, there was a bit of an issue, and you might be able to just see it off the side there. The epipremnum corner, as I call it, had a bit of an issue and a bit of a wobble. It's doing a lot better now, by the way. But also, new slight setup, trying different things with cameras and lights and microphones. Tell me if this is any better or not, basically. The next plant, I do have one next to me, and there is a slightly older version of this upstairs in my office, and hopefully if I find a video, I will add it here. That one's not looking that great. And this, for the kind of eagle-eyed amongst you, is the Aspidistra, or otherwise known as the cast iron plant. And there is a reason why this is a plant that has been popular, at least here in the UK, pretty much since the Victorian age. I'm pretty sure that's how long this has been kind of really popular because it is a bit of a juggernaut. It isn't the most exciting of house plants. It's got kind of very paddly leaves. I think if I'm not mistaken, this is also a grass technically. And if I'm not mistaken again, this comes from Japan or that kind of region of the world there. Part of the reasons why people back then decided to add this plant specifically to their collections, and I think the reason why it got its name, cast iron plant, is because a lot of the times they would put this right next to kind of fireplaces and things like that. The air quality wasn't great. The air might have been really dry as well. It wasn't getting an awful lot of light. So these are ones that are low light tolerant. And we've said this several times on this channel, just because they are marketed as low light plants, it doesn't mean that they will necessarily do their best in low light. It just means that they will die slower, basically. And slow is <laughs> a word that you might hear a lot of the times when it comes to the Aspidistra. This is a particularly slow, slow growing plant. Think ZZ plant, yeah? And it's very, very similar. I think this is more impressive than the average ZZ plant because it kind of gives you kind of big leaf vibes. And the other reason why this has survived, barring the fact that it's very easy to care for, it doesn't need very often watering, it can take exceptionally low light conditions. But one of the other things about this plant specifically is, if I am not mistaken, and this is part of the reason why I got this, because this is quite low in the kind of kitchen dining area that I have, which means that Duke, the puppy, might be able to reach this as well. And I will give you a little update picture of Duke. He's doing okay. He's still a teenager. He's still testing my nerves and my patience, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. <sighs> Adult brains are slowly setting in, which is good. But, but part of the reason why I wanted this is because it is one of the house plants that isn't quite as bad for pets if they do eat it, if I'm not mistaken. So this is why I got it. I would have easily have put something like a ZZ there or a Pothos, but both of those aren't great options. If you've got pets that like to munch on leaves, I think this is a relatively safe kind of plant for that. So the next one on the list, I don't have in front of me because again, it's not an easy one to move, but I will see if I can add a video here. And this is kind of the humble Monstera adansonii. And again, another plant that I've got in different forms around my collection. And this is one that I had one in the very beginning of kind of like my plant collecting journey. Anybody who has seen the video on my top five plants that thrips like, and I will add it at the top, they will know that this is a plant that I lost quite early on in my collection because of thrips. I didn't realize at that point that it was thrips. It got replaced quite quickly. I do also, as I said, have other versions of this plant. So for instance, and we've kind of talked about this before, that I have got the, <laughs> the splashy minty <laughs> Monstera adansonia variegata, which I will still say does look a bit like it might be disease, and I'll see if I can bring it in a bit closer so you might be able to see. And then I do have the yellow variegated monster, which again is very difficult for me to pull out of the shelf, but I will see about adding a videos here. And I do have a plant that does look like an Adansonia, and a lot of times people might consider it to be an Adansonia, but it is an entirely different one, and it's this is a bit of an excuse for me to show it off. It's not big yet, but I've been wanting this plant for years. And I finally got one in my collection and it's doing okay. 
the Monstera Esqueleto. So you might be able to see, if I put it next to my face, the size of some of those leaves. This came to me with these two baby leaves at the bottom. This was an eBay purchase and it was a rooted cutting, but it's doing very, very well. And I am so happy with this. It's kind of slowed down a bit now for winter, I think, but I'm really looking forward to this growing much, much larger if possible during the summer. But yeah, with the Adansonii, it is again that ease. For me, it grows like a weed, whether I have it in the household conditions or whether or not I have it in here. Actually, ironically enough, I think it prefers household conditions more than it does in here. So definitely one that has stuck around for quite a few years now. As I said, in many different formats, in many different ways, in very many different locations in the house, and it still seems to be kind of keeping on and doing its own thing. The next big thing that has done really, really well in my care, and I think I'm trying to remember now, some of these plants, both of these plants that I'm about to show you, I think I have had for over eight or nine years now. So I am talking about orchids, more specifically Phalaenopsis type orchids. I've got the slightly trickier orchids more recently, and I've used quite a few of the north designs in terms of the mounts and i know you've seen it on some of the other videos but yeah phalaenopsis type orchids just do exceptionally well for me i know this isn't one that might be in everybody's top 10 but they do really really well for me i don't know whether or not this smaller version is a true phalaenopsis because it's called phalaenopsis orchid mini but i think from chat that i've seen online they're not always actually phalaenopsis orchids or moth orchids and things like that. But yeah, this one, the reason why I've bought it here is because this is my true kind of trooper, really. This plant specifically, I don't think it has ever been not in bloom for the eight or nine years that I have had it. It has always got at least one flower spike on with multiple blooms, and you might be able to see all the different buds that are coming through. I have bought one of my kind of more standard Phalaenopsis orchids, the bigger ones. And yes, there is a yellowing leaf. And oh, there we go. So this one, you might be able to see quite how many flower spikes and blooms there is. And I've done nothing special with this other than the usual care that I give for these plants. As I said, this isn't necessarily one that's going to be in the same list for everybody because I know some people might struggle with Phalaenopsis orchids. But in case you're wondering what I do with them, not, not an awful lot. They tend to be in my brightest windows, the same way that I would have a cactus right in the window, usually above radiators. And they are literally one of the few plants in my collection that are on schedules where once a week, usually Sunday today when I'm filming this, I'm going to be watering all of these later on. And for the people that have been here for a while, I am managing to film before I have watered. So everything isn't dripping wet, <laughs> winning in life. But yeah, this is one of the plants that, yeah, once a week, I will kind of put a couple of drops of orchid fertilizer directly into the pot, fill the rest of the pot up, the cash po basically with water. And you will see that's the pot inside. And then there is a cash po. And I will let these sit in that water 20 minutes half an hour some people just like don't just make sure that using lukewarm water I just use cold water as it comes out of the tap even in the winter here in the UK year-round no problem absolutely fine then make sure that I drain off all the water put it back into the cash pot, put it back to where it is done that is it so for that reason these have remained for a very long time. And I think my probably at this point, maybe about 10 or 12 Phalaenopsis orchids. <laughs> there was a point when I was first starting off that people just kept buying me Phalaenopsis orchids, predominantly from the supermarket. But they've done quite, quite well, basically. So this had to be in my top 10. The next one is kind of apt to this time of the year as well. And you might be able to see it in front of me here. And I'll bring it in so you might be able to see it a bit better there. And this is my holiday cactus. <laughs> I want to say Christmas cactus, but I don't think it is a Christmas cactus. It always flowers around Christmas for me, but based on what I have seen online in terms of how blooms look, in terms of how, not the blooms specifically, actually, I think it's the, the, the kind of 
leaves. I want to call them leaves. I don't even know if they are actually called leaves. But I think this might be a Thanksgiving cactus. It's not a Christmas cactus, I don't think. And it's definitely not um, a kind of Easter cactus, really. But, I mean, granted, this, this year, the blooms on this is a spectacular. I've not had anywhere near this much bloomage in the past, but it is doing quite well. It is also got an awful lot of, and I was, I'm picking them off. It has got not an awful lot, but it has got a few mealy bugs that I need to deal with. <laughs> I'm going to be entirely honest. This has got nowhere near other plants. So the mealy bugs will stay on there for a bit now until these blooms kind of drop off, which usually doesn't take that long. The blooms don't stay on for that that long, but I will then kind of treat it for mealybugs. If I try to do it now, it will just mess up all of the blooms, basically. But part of the reasons why this stayed in my collection is, again, set it and forget it kind of plant. This is in a south-facing window year-round. It is in the smallest little terracotta pot. I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is in an aroid soil mix, because, again, this is a kind of jungle cactus. It is not a regular cactus, so it needs slightly different soil conditions, I found at least. It gets watered pretty much like once a week, I think, and it does really well. It does really, really well. I mean, and this is kind of almost another one of those poster child plants that you will see aunts and mothers and grandmothers and all of these people who have had theirs for generations. And these are plants that as well that tend to be gifted down to kids or grandkids it is insane and you can see some massive massive plants and if you want to see some really established very old specimens of something like a holiday cactus check out sarah and the plant rescuer on instagram if you haven't already discovered sarah oh, love sarah i will see about linking her instagram down below for the people that don't know sarah and if there are any people that are fans of Sarah and they just saw my orchids with the flower spikes being staked up, I am aware me and Sarah have had multiple conversations about the fact that the flower spikes do not need to be kind of essentially tied upwards. They can just hang down. And I would normally do it, but <laughs> a space. I don't have the space to kind of let them hang down. I have done in the past and they do look beautiful. I actually prefer it when the flower spikes for the orchids hang a bit more naturally that they might do in nature rather than the being staked up but <laughs> it just wouldn't work in my collection so they are still getting staked it's it's more for function rather than a beauty if that makes sense but yeah in terms of the holiday cactuses strong firm favorite it doesn't give me any hassle and once a year i get a show like this which is beautiful and it's it's nice again because there's not an awful lot of things that will give you blooms in some of the coldest of months this doesn't do an awful lot in the summer it's a bit of a blah plant in the summer but yeah great and to be fair i say blah plant in the summer some of the older much larger specimens that are much longer they still look quite impressive even in the summer usually people kind of will display them somewhere and the ultimate plant that people just ignore for generations and they still survive basically now the next one, and I'll bring it up, <laughs> but again, probably isn't going to surprise anybody. The Chinese money plant, jade plant, Crassula ovata. And it's one of the few remaining succulents that I've still got in my collection. I do have a few succulents, but, and I know a lot of people are getting into succulents again, but I'm a hovering plant parent. Succulents don't really do it for me because yes, they do look beautiful. I also have zero patience, so they do take a while to grow. This might not look that impressive. This is also another eight or nine year old plant. And you'd be sitting there going, well, this is not that large for a nine year old plant. The stems have finally got woody. They're quite thick, but let me give you an idea of kind of how thin it was it was one stem the size of that when i first got it or two or three stems basically they were still in there and they were tiny they were probably only about this big this has done really well especially considering that again set it and forget it type of plant great great one to have around the house I know there is a different version of this, which is sometimes called Shrek ears. So the leaves are a bit more kind of like crinkled and yeah, absolutely fantastic plant. And it does have a bit of a kind of cultural significance, if I'm not mistaken, to some of the Asian nations, basically. I oh, remember, let me put this down because it's very heavy. 
<laughs> so uh, as I was saying, there's some si cultural significance. My uh, best friend, she is half Greek, half Singaporean, if I'm not mistaken. I had to think about this moment because I think her mum is either, she, her mum herself might be half Singaporean, half Indonesian. I'm not entirely sure. But she had a jade plant that was growing. It's one of the few things that she was ever growing. And she kind of messaged me in a panic going, ah, I don't know what's happening to my plant. It's all gone like red. And I'm just like, pull it back from the light slightly. Mine does sit in a south facing window. And I've never had that much kind of anthocyanins or the blushing that you get, which is essentially the plant trying to protect itself. It's kind of creating its own sunblock. But she managed to really kind of sun stress it. So I'm just like, just give it a slightly bit less light. And it should be fine and bounce back. And it did. And I mean, it's a testament to how strong the Crassula ovata is, is a plant that, again, these ones that you tend to see everywhere for years. And if you go to kind of a lot of times you might get it in uh, Chinese takeout places and they've got ones that are almost the size of a tree. And they're just sitting there in the window. And you probably know that if the people that are running that business, some of them probably care for it quite a bit. But there's a lot of times that they are just forgotten plants. So there's usually spider webs all over it. Spider webs, not spider mites. <laughs> and these plants survive. They, they just keep on doing their own thing. There's a reason why people have had them for decades. The next one, at least, might surprise you, which is calatheas. I have still got some calatheas in my care, and I will pick one up and show you, actually. So this is an example of one, and I'm trying to think how many I've still got. One, two, three, four, five, six, probably, at this point. So this is the calathea warso whiskey. Mm, I can never, like, I am butchering what I'm assuming might be kind of a Polish name. I might be wrong, but the way that that name is kind of set. If there is any people that follow me or are watching this video from that region of the world, I am truly sorry for probably butchering your beautiful language, but I am trying. If you want to tell me how to pronounce it properly, do so in the comments down below. But um, beautiful, beautiful plants. This one, and as I said, I've had them in one way or another. This one I actually got as a trade at uh, the last, not the last, the one before London Plant Swap. And the amazing person that I kind of swapped this saw me at the last of it going, uh -huh, you probably still don't have it. I'm just like, no, here you go. Proof. It is still here. It is still doing well. And to be fair, I will quantify this before people come for me for like the fact that I've got my Calathea or a Calathea generally in this top 10 of things that survive. This is in my conditions. So basically, I have got certain of the plant shelves that are so, so low down below where not an awful lot of light gets into them. But this space does get a decent volume of light generally because of the way that the conservatory is set up with glass all around, even the painted glass at the moment. But the humidity conditions in here are quite strong. And I've also got fans running all the time, which generally means the calatheas that I do have in here don't tend to give me as much grief as you might get in regular household conditions. I am sure that for a lot of you, this is not going to be, or calatheas in generally are not going to be part of your top tens. Marantas might be. But yeah, this is this is one that I've enjoyed growing, truly. Like when I first saw these online when people were talking about them and it was a velvet leaf calathea and I'm just like oh but I've had the zebrina and I do love the zebrina when I had it did not survive but and I do love that kind of feel on the leaves and I saw this and I used to see it online and I'm just like it's not that interesting the leaves are not that impressive there's better looking ones again I think the zebrina does look a bit better than this but actually I've really kind of come to love this plant it's still a calathea things that go with it i did do a video ages ago and i will link it at the top about how i care for my calatheas which means that i've had less grief with them over the years the next one again i cannot move from its location it's kind of difficult to kind of shift that plant around but i will add a photo or a video on the side here and this is my hoya crinkle eight and you knew there was going to be a Hoya on here somewhere, basically. But some of you might be surprised that I went with the Hoya Crinkle 8 specifically and not one of the other Hoyas. I will say that out of all of my Hoyas, the Hoya Crinkle 8 gives me the least amount of trouble, basically. At any given point of the year, it might be infested with mealybugs. I treat it. It's fine. It blooms heavily for me year after year. That's within the first year of owning it, it started blooming. 
it's been bleached. The leaves have been bleached from like kind of overly bright south facing window that it's been for years. It's fine. It does what it needs to do. And at this point for me, it probably does need a bit of a repot. It's probably been in the same pot for a good eight years now um, to the point that I know this because it's kind of stopped growing bigger, but it does get more blooms. And I've touched on kind of root bound Hoyas and the, the kind of equation that I see in terms of how root bound it is and how many blooms it will produce. This produces an awful lot of blooms, but for where it is, I'm okay for it to just stay in its pot and just produce heavy amounts of blooms all summer long for me without getting much larger, purely because it's filling up that space that I want it to fill up. But generally out of all of my Hoyas, the Crinkle 8 might not be the most impressive in terms of foliage and things like that. I still like the kookiness of the slightly deformed kind of ab looking kind of leaves. But yeah, it had to be on my top 10 because it's just a plant that I don't have to worry about. It's one of my feral plant children as people that have been here for a while will probably know. So it does great. Love the Hoyo Crinkle 8. The next plant you might be able to see kind of to the side here. And again, hopefully I'll have some videos and add it to the side here. But Ficus Elastica, mm -hmm. I mean, come on. And this should tell you something because this is possibly the only ficus that I've still got in my care. I, me and ficuses do not work well together. Do I think that most of them are absolutely stunning? Yes. Do I think that they're the ones that really do give that tree vibe in the doors? Yes, in the doors? Indoors. <laughs> Sunday words. <laughs> But yeah, they are the ones that will give you those kind of tree vibes in the house. And hopefully if I've got an image, I will add an image of a little forest of uh, Ficus umbellata everest. Or I might be wrong. It might have been something else. I think I, I wanted an umbellata or umbellalata, uh, but I got the Everest one instead. Beautiful plant. <laughs> Mealybugs. <laughs> Decimated that plant. But also... The, the slight fussiness that you might get with ficuses, if you move it too much, if you change its conditions too much, if you kind of skip a watering, it kind of throws a wobbly and drops leaves. And that is true. I found out of all of the different ficuses, the Elastica is the most forgiving. I do also have other versions of it now. And you might be able to see this here. So this is the Ficus Elastica Chivariana. I'm looking down because I've got my viewfinder from my camera down below now. So very, very, very cool plant. And to be fair, I was a bit worried if this is going to be more kind of needy than the standard ficus elastica. Nope. As easy as the ficus elastica. It just does its thing slightly slower because obviously there's nowhere near as much chlorophyll on the leaves. They are very highly variegated. But mm, love this plant. And that's why it's also has pride of place kind of in my collection here. So yeah, and it, it, it works for me. The fact that it needs those certain condition works for me because I know that this plant without fail on a Sunday will get watered and it will just keep doing its thing basically. I don't have to worry about it. It generally doesn't get that many pests. And if I do find the occasional mealy bug on it or the occasional kind of few spider mites, I can deal with it. And Unlike most other plants where I need to go back and retreat every couple of weeks, with these plants I treat it once and this has been my experience, I don't have to do it that often. I'm sure your experiences might vary. But for me, they've been relatively easy plants and I do enjoy them. They're very, very, very cool. I don't know, actually no, I was going to say I don't know if I would go for the all green Ficus Elastica, but there is a dark green Ficus Elastica that I'm trying to think, is it the Abidjan or something like that? And that's equally quite beautiful. It's giving those kind of dark green unctuous leaf vibes. So yeah, I do still like this plant. Is it one that could look quite nice if it branches out and gets more leaves yes there's also an awful lot of these and if i do find a picture i will add it somewhere of these just growing as regular kind of pavement trees in greece everywhere basically so i don't know how else to describe it you know the kind of trees that are growing by by the council usually by the the county council the city council they've got kind of trees growing in the sidewalk basically to shade people in greece these are everywhere and they grow like wild so yeah 
it's also slightly reminiscent of home for me. So love my Ficus elasticus. And you know I had to end on a Sansevierias, which are now Dracaenas. So this is one of my oldest, oldest plants. It's a very heavy pot, um, which is in a cash po. I'm not going to try lifting it up because trying to, trying to, oh, there you go. I have lifted it up. <laughs> this is a plant that I wanted for a very dark space, and it does exactly what it needs to do. Has it grown massively since I first got it like a few years ago? No, but it's still surviving, it's still providing what I need to, to provide. It is a cupboard. I'm looking at it now in dust. So this is one that I'm going to leave it as is for now. Come the summertime, I'll just take it out and just give it a quick hose down in the garden just to get some of that dust off. But yeah, really, really, there is a reason why so many people have kept snake plants for as long as they have, because um, it's obviously not a plant that needs an awful lot of fussing. I do also have other versions of this plant, and again, it shows that kind of, not only have I kept the very, very common form, but I've also got variations of it, basically. So one you might be able to see in front of me here, and this is the Sansevieria Moonlight or Moonshine. This is quite an established plant now, and it's pupping like mad. This is in Semihydro, and it's doing very, very well. Not all of my Sansevierias, now Dracaenas, are doing well in Semihydro. That one is. That one is sitting in my bedroom window, which is south-facing. I have also got the Starfish Sansevieria still. I think I've also got the Samurai Sansevieria. I've had the canary one at some point. I've had the whale fin at some point. I don't think that those ever gave me grief and that's why they're not here. I think they were just, I got tired of them specifically so I have gifted them to people and I think they are still doing strong in those people's collections. So, mm. but yeah, Sansevierius for me, hands down, super easy plant, does what I needed to do. And I think some of these, might be similar for a lot of other people as well because of their kind of ease basically. So that was my top 10. Did any of those surprise you other than the Calathea? I'm assuming that the Calathea probably surprised quite a few people. But did some of those surprise you? Does your top 10 match with my top 10? And I think there probably is going to be quite a bit of overlap potentially for some people. There might not be because personal preferences, you might find that some plants like these do look a bit dull and a bit boring in comparison to some of the other ones. And that is, and this is why it's always kind of personal preference in terms of what we all like. But I would imagine that a lot of people's top five, top tens, much like mine, will probably be plants that they can kind of let be feral and not have to worry about, and they might forget about them sometimes, but they're still there and people do not kind of get rid of those plants because you know what they're good for what they need to be they're they're occupying a space in your house they're adding a bit of green without you needing to fuss over them quite as much as some of the plants that you might be able to see behind me but there is something for the unsung heroes that is some of these long-standing common house plants which i thought would be nice to kind of give them the spotlight today as i said there will be a companion video to this which will be coming up at the end of the week and that will be the top 10 common house plants that did not survive in my care basically so the polar opposite of this that one might be slightly more negative not entirely i don't think but yeah so hopefully you enjoyed hopefully i shall see you here soon and i truly truly hope that you have a great rest of your day thanks bye